Welcome to the third video of the module. Um, the, uh, last video you saw my son currently stole my marker, so uh, he's walking around. Luckily I've got another one. He's trying to write on the walls now. There, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> Hey buddy. Alright, anyway, let's just kind of go through the notes and then I'm going to kind of help you out on some things. Uh, Alright, uh, we're going to be talking about in this video precision and accuracy. Uh, quite frankly, the definitions that you may know from just your everyday life are not necessarily applicable to what we use these, def these words in mathematics. Uh, this is a true of a lot of things. There's sometimes we use words in math that are completely different in the real world. And this is one of those times. Um, all right, so for instance, let's just go ahead and give you the mathematical definition for the word accuracy. Accuracy is the number of significant digits that a number has. I, I can almost see the deer caught in the headlight look that you probably just had listening to what I just said. All right, so don't worry. The next one, precision. It is, a num it is the decimal position of the last significant digit. Oh, huh? Can you make that face? Huh? You do it. Huh? Yeah, he won't do it. He's bashful. All right, so what does all that mean? So what, what we have to do is before we can explain what accuracy and precision really are to a really good detail, we need to understand their term, term significant digit. So, best way I can do it is with that chart that I've given you in your notes. You see those rules, one through six? Pause the video right now and take those rules and write it on your formula sheet. Alright? Now, you are going to want that on test day. Okay? Have those rules on your formula sheet. It will help you drastically. Hopefully I've got my boy situated so he won't bother us too much. He's off screen right now eating some Cheerios and he seems to be content and happy. So maybe we can get through this video after all. Alright, so going back to this thing, I told you to write down those rules for significant digits in your notes because they are going to be very useful to you. Uh, but what does it all mean? Um, numbers have digits, we know that, but we use these rules to determine which digits are important. Um, and not all digits in a number are important. And how, why do we define that? Hmm. How do we define that? Hmm. Somebody just like somebody just said, "Hey, let's make some rules." And the other math god said, "Hey, that sounds wonderful." So why we do this, I'm not really quite sure, except that it is beneficial when we're doing units of measurements, um, and especially in science and chemistry. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Using this, these things help us make sure that we. Are, I hate using the word precise and accurate again, but it makes it allows us to be as exact as possible in using the correct chemicals and certain reactions and stuff like that. It's just one of those things. That's why we use it. Again, I will tell you this. Quite frankly, you probably will not use significant digits all that much in the real world unless you're in the science field, mostly in chemistry. Um, that's about the only place that I've heard about it. All right, moving on with our lives. All right, so what our job currently to do, now to do, is just to count the number of significant digits a number has. All right, so the number one, well, if you go through your rules, the number one only has one significant digit because it follows under rule one. Digits that are between 1 and 9 are always significant. If I have this number, the number 4, the 4 is significant, and I only have one significant digit. Okay? Don't confuse this with 4. All right? You don't have four significant digits here. You only have one number, so it's only one significant digit. All right, so now let's go ahead and start using the chart. Alright, so number one we've already done. Let's look at 20. 
let's go through the rules. Digits between 1 and 9 are always significant. That's significant. All right? Then it says zeros between two significant digits are significant. Well, is this zero between two? No, it's not. Then it says zeros at the end of a decimal are significant. Is this zero at the end of a decimal? Well, this number is a whole number. This zero is not a significant number. All right? Zeros written with a bar notation of it. Zeros written like this are significant. Well, that's not significant. Go to the next one. Zeros at the end of a whole number are not significant. This zero is in a whole number. It's at the end of a whole number. So this number is not significant. So the number 20 only has one significant digit. Go through your rules. First rule, automatically, any number between 1 and 9 is significant. A while ago, I stated that 0 with a bar over it is significant. Now, what about this guy? Well, here's a rule. It is actually rule number 2. Zeros between two significant digits are significant. This 0 is between two significant digits. Therefore, it's also significant. So this number has a total of three significant digits. Automatically, you should say one and six because of rule one. And then because of rule two, that. Because that zero is between these two. So all this one, 1.06, 1 has three significant digits. Seventy-eight point zero, automatically seven and eight. One, two. What about that zero? Well, we can't use rule two. Then it says rule three. Zeros at the right end of a decimal are significant. This is a zero. It's at the end of a decimal number. Therefore, it's significant. So this number has three significant digits. I'm going to go ahead and through the rest of the chart with you. 500. Automatically. Go through your rules. Rule 2 don't help. Rule 3 does not currently help. Rule 4 does not currently help. Rule 5. Zeros at the end of a whole number. This 500 is a whole number. The zeros are at the end. These are not significant digits. So the number 500 only has one significant digit. Seventy thousand six hundred. Automatically the seven the six. That's rule one. When you look at this you should say hey that's significant because it was between two significance. That was rule two. This is a whole number. These zeros are at the end of the whole number. So these zeros are not significant, so this number only has three significant digits. Automatically, seven, six, rule one. Rule two, automatically. All right, what about this guy? A while ago, I said with a bar notation, it's significant, so automatically you should read it, hey, that's a significant digit. You look at this one, it's between two, Bam! It's also a significant digit. So you have a total of five. Now, I will tell you this. In your homework, this is in the real world, this bar notation. You don't see this in your homework, but I just don't want you ignorant of it. So you won't see this in your homework, but I don't want you ignorant of it, and I want you aware. Last one. Automatically. Okay, go through your rules. Two, well that doesn't help us right now. Three, it says at the end of a decimal are significant. This zero is at the end of a decimal, so it is significant. All right, four, doesn't help us. 
five at the end of a whole number. This is not a whole number. This is a decimal number, so it doesn't help us. Six zeros on the left of a number. Notice I said of a number. It doesn't mean any. It means any number at all, such as a decimal. The zeros on the left side, zero, 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 are not significant. So this only has two significant digits. You having fun there, buddy? He's like staring and burping. I don't know if you heard that or not. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. You're being rude to the, to the students. You know that, right? Yeah. You should apologize. He's trying to give you a cheerio. Okay. All right. So this number only has two significant digits. All right. Uh, one last number, it's not in your notes, but I do want to show it to you just to make you think. Zero, zero, there's no decimal here. One, three, excuse me, one, zero, three. Automatically, automatically, this zero you should figure it out automatically. These, that should be quick like that because of those rules. Well, these zeros, they're at the left side of the number. So we don't count them. Quite frankly, we don't write whole numbers like this anyway. That's why we only write it 103. Okay? Think of it like the only place that you see this is if you have a brand new car that has an odometer that says that. But those zeros don't mean anything. We just write it, read it as, hey, we've only this car has only been 103 miles. We don't read it as 00103 miles. That would be silly. All right. A gut. All right. Now that we understand what significant digits are and how to find them, you should be able to identify a uh, the accuracy and precision of a number fairly quickly now. So let's just go on to the next page, like you saw me throw it up in the air. It's kind of like I said before. It's very therapeutic. All right. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. I'm going to let you do some of these on your own. But look at the definition now. Accuracy is the number of significant digit that a number has. All those things that we just did on that previous page, we were finding accuracy. That's all it was. The accuracy of one is one. The accuracy of 14 is two. All right, now, so let's look at these numbers. I'm going to just do a couple of them. So 0 0.12, we want to know the accuracy and we want to know the precision. Okay? The accuracy is how many uh, significant digits there are. Well, we know this to only have 1, 2. So the accuracy is just 2. The precision is the decimal position in the last significant digit. Well, this number, the last significant digit, is this 2. What place value is this in? It is in the hundredth positions. So the accuracy is two, and the precision is to the hundredth. All right. What about this number, 140? Well, we know this to be a sig fig. We know this to be a sig fig. Is sorry, I said sig fig. I, it's significant. You may hear me say that a lot, especially in class. I was taught that significant digits were significant figures, and sig figs is just a whole lot more fun to say than significant digit. So I'm going to start saying sig figs, okay? Um, so sig figs and significant digits, same thing. It's just another way of saying it. And sig figs is just a lot more fun. So we have one's a sig fig, four's a sig fig. This zero, it is not. So our accuracy is based upon how many significant figs or figures that we have are sig figs, significant digits. Two. All right. Now, your instinct of precision is to look at the last number probably. Ah, ah. You look at the last significant digit. You look at the very last sig fig. The very last sig fig, what position is this in? It's actually in the 10. That is the correct answer. Don't, just because there's a zero in the one spot doesn't mean that the precision is to the ones, it, mm, to the ones position, excuse me, stuttered. It's actually, in this case, to the 10 spot. Now, what if 
This is not on your chart. This is a freebie. If I gave you this, 141. Well, now that's a significant digit. So my accuracy is 2 to 3. And since this is a significant digit, are you okay? Okay. Your precision is to the 1's position. Okay. So let's go on to the next one. Automatically, the one and the five. That's rule one. Rule two states that zeros between two sig figs are sig figs. So yoink, yoink. Those are sig figs as well. So our accuracy is four. Our precision, well, the last significant figure or significant digit was in the hundredth position. So. We're going to write hundredth position. All right, now you stop it. All right, so what I want you to do now is I want you to do the next three on your own in that chart. Pause the video. When you come back, I'll show you your answers. All right, so these are your answers that you should have. Uh, if you didn't get that and you got questions, you know how to get up with me. So when you understand what significant digits are, it, accuracy and precision are fairly under, easy to understand, especially if you're just asking for what they are. However, math sucks, and we make things harder than because we like to do that to people. We just do. It's fun. Uh, I don't know why. We just like to aggravate people by making math harder. So in this next thing, it's not that we're going to be looking at how precision and accuracy affect mathematical operations. So the first thing I want you to look at is adding and subtracting. This, uh, I'm going to read the rules to you first. It says, when adding or subtracting, the answer is expressed with the precision of the least precise number. Alright, so we have a very simple thing. 2.35 plus 1.5 plus 5.5. Alright, so the easiest way for you to do this is to put it in your calculator. Alright, let's do that first. Do it first. It's okay. Use your calculator. Alright, when you do and you add this up, you actually get 9.35. Now, your instinct might be put this into your uh, answer box. That's not correct because the problem says round to the correct precision, okay? All right, that's what we're trying to do. So how do we do that? Well, when we're adding or subtracting, the rule states that we express with the least precise number. So we need to look at, with, at each one of these problems. The precision of this particular number is to the hundredths, okay? To the hundredths place. The precision of this one and of this one happen to be to the tenth. Alright, to the tenth position. I spit right there when I said tenth. Alright, so we need to compare these. Since this hundredth and tenth, we're going to compare these. Which number, which precision is, for lack of a better term, more precise, more detailed? That's a good word we want to use. Which number is more detailed? Think this through. Hey, this has got a little bit more decimals, don't it? These only have one decimal. This has two decimal places. This has one decimal place. This is the least precise because it went to the tenth position. So it's least precise. So what we are going to do is to take our final answer and round the tenth position. Well, the tenth position is that three. Go back to your rules of rounding. We look to the right. That five. Hang on just a moment. All right. Let's try that again. This 5 tells that 3 to go up, so we get 9.4, and the 5 becomes a 0. Remember your rules of rounding. Trailing zeros at the end of the decimal get dropped, so our final answer is 9.4.
All right. So we're going to pause the video and we'll take care of my kid and we'll come back to the next problem. All right, so in our next problem, we have 6.78 minus 3.4. As with the last one, you simply can just go ahead and subtract by using your calculator. And when you do, you get 3.38. However, since this is subtracting and I need to make sure it's rounded to the correct precision, we're going to look at which number is the least precise. This number is precise to the hundredth. This is precise to the tenth, meaning that this number 3.4 is the least precise because it only went to the tenth. So I'm going to round my answer to the nearest tenth. This 8 tells that 3 to go up, so we get 3.4. All the numbers over here become 0. And, trail, and since I've done this, all my trailing zeros at the end of a decimal get dropped. So this number just becomes 3.4. All right, now. That's pretty easy. Multiplication and division get just a little bit annoying because it doesn't always quite do what you think it should do. It doesn't all, and the answer doesn't always make sense. Uh, case in point, let's do 5 times 9. Okay? Well, we already know what 5 times 9 is. It's 45. Okay? So, look at the rules first. Let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say that, uh, here we go, when multiplying or dividing, the answer is expressed to the accuracy of the least accurate. In other words, you're going to look at how many significant digits the original, in the original problem and then round to the least amount of significant digits. Okay, so, how many significant digits are here? There's only one. So, I'm going to put SF. One significant figure or significant digit. How many are in this nine? There's only one. Okay? So that's telling me I need to round this guy to one significant figure. How do I do that? Well, I start on the left side of my number and I count towards the right. And I'm only going to count one time. One. So that first number, that first four, is a significant figure. And therefore, I'm going to round that four. That 5 tells the 4 to go up, the, zero, the 5 becomes a 0. Now, you're, I have a lot of people who like to do this. Round it to 5. They drop the 0. Why is that wrong? Well, 1, the rule states that trailing zeros at the end of a decimal can get dropped. Is this at the end of a decimal? No, it's not. So we can't drop it. But here's a better explanation. How do you go from 45 to $5? Think about that for a second. You went to Walmart and you expect $45 and change and they only gave you $5 back? You're going to look at the cashier like they're a dummy. So, look at what you, how you rounded it. Did it make sense to the context of the question? You can't go from 45 to 5, but you can go from 45 to 50. You stop making noises in my video. You're just being rude. <sighs> All right. You drop your milk. I know. All right. So let's try the next one, if you don't mind. So this problem we have 2.0 times 2.107. Just like last time, we simply are going to multiply it out, and you get 4.217. However, since we are trying to get it to the correct accuracy, we're going to round to the least accurate number. So, how many significant digits are here? Well, we have one, two. So that's two, accuracy of two, sig figs. This has one, two, three, four. So, four sig figs. So we're going to round our final answer to two sig figs. So we're going to look at our, our sig figs over here. All of these are sig figs, but we're only going to round to two significant ones, to the very first two. So that's the first one, that's the second one. This one tells that two to stay the same, and we get 4.2. The one and the seven become zeros, and since these zeros are at the end of the decimal and they're trailing zeros, they can be dropped, and our final answer is 4.2. Now. 
I'm gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna do number three with you, uh, just to kind of show you one more time, and uh, just to show you multiplication. But after that, I'm not gonna worry about number four. Um, I think you, I think you get the idea how this works. But you have 144 divided by 12. Oh, by the way, I noticed on the notes the division symbol did not print out uh, correctly. So you make sure you put the division symbol 144 divided by 12. I apologize about that. I'll have to try to fix that later, and we'll see. Probably won't. I'll probably just use this video forever and ever and ever. So I probably won't change change the sheet. Why waste my time? All right, well, you can just write it. All right, so my son's walked out, so maybe we get a little bit of peace and quiet. All right, now, 144 divided by 12, we know to be simply 12. So we need to round this to correct accuracy. Well, the accuracy on this is three sig figs. The accuracy on this is two sig figs. So we're going to round this to two sig figs. Hey, check this out. That's got one that has two. So the answer is 12. Hey, that one actually makes sense. All right. So again, I'm not going to do number four with you. I think you get the point. Uh, again, you know how to find me. Yeah, I'm done with that. All right. Changing fractions and mixed fractions into decimals. Uh, um, not that bad. All right. Um. Uh, Last video, we already kind of showed how to do it. You remember, we had something very simple like this. Uh, we had 3 over 4, and when we changed that into a decimal, we simply divided, and we got a nice number such as 0 0.75. It's a nice, beautiful number. Okay. However, this time, well, we don't have nice, beautiful numbers. And it says, write each of the following fractions as a decimal number rounded to two decimal places. Eh, not that hard. All right, so three sixteenths. I'm stepping on Cheerios. Thank you, Daniel, for throwing Cheerios all under my feet. All right, three over, under, over 16. <laughs> you got to love these videos. You'll never see another teacher this nut to have his child in there and make funny voices. You'll never see another teacher like this. All right, so 3 over 16, change it to a decimal by how? Dividing. And what you get is going to be, the, as the decimal, is 0 0.1875. Oh, I did have a little chart going on there. So here's my fraction, just to make it even. That's my decimal, and this is my rounded decimal. All right, so 3 sixteenths to the decimal is 0 0.1875. The rounded decimal, well, since we're rounding to two places, well, this is a per, my first decimal place. This is my second decimal place. So that 7 is telling that 8 to go up. So I get 0, 1.9. All right, I'm not going to do all the processes now. I think you get rounding, so I'm just going to kind of skip some of these steps and get to the final answer. All right. Good? All right. He likes it. Okay. Um, yeah, you hear I'm saying good? All right, uh, 9 over 32. All right, well, we get 0 0.28, yep, that's me, buddy, 8125. We round this, and we're just going to get 0 0.28. All right, the next one. This actually uh, seems to look hard because... This is 3 and 5 eighths, but it's not so bad. First off, don't look at the whole number. Look at the fraction. Find out what 5 eighths is equal to. 5 eighths is just equal to 6.625. However, this isn't just 5 eighths like I've got here. It's 3 and 5 eighths. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that 3 where all these zeros have been, because this has just been a fraction, since this is a whole number, I'm going to put that whole number where the zero usually goes. So the decimal for 3 and 5 eighths is 3.625. All right. The rounded correct decimal is 3.63. All right. Last one. 4 and 13 sixty-fourths. Do the decimal 
first, this fraction first, 13 divided by 64 is going to give you two, uh, excuse me, 0 0.203125. Since I have a whole number here, it's going to go where my zero normally goes. It's a four. Round that, 4.20. This little trick that I'm showing you is fairly simple. So, and this is how we put things in our calculator. So if I wanted to put 3 and 5 eighths in my calculator, this is what you would do. You would say 5 divided by 8. And what you would have in your calculator right now is 0.625. Now, since this is 3 and 5 eighths, add the number 3. Hit Enter. Now your calculator says 3.625. That skill of being able to put this number in your calculator is going to save you in the very, very near future. Remember it. Do the fraction first and then add the whole number. It is going to help you. All right. Uh, changing decimals into fractions with a specific denominator. All right, for this one, it says, um, to accomplish this, I'm not going to read all of this, but it says, to accomplish this, you uh, multiply the decimal digits, so you multiply the decimal digits by the needed denominator, okay, and round to the nearest whole number. So, uh, what does all that mean? All right, so I just wanted to fill, fill in this little blank first. So, your first blank in that paragraph, to accomplish this, you multiply and round to the nearest whole number. So, now, let me explain to you what is actually happening in what I'm trying to teach you here. Sometimes you get a decimal number in especially construction and industrial settings and that decimal number doesn't make sense because when you look at a tape measure it only measures to the nearest 32nd or the nearest 16th or the quarter or half or whatever and so you don't have decimal tape measures um, normal tape measure like I said only goes to the nearest 32nd and so what you have to do is you have to take that number and round it to the nearest fraction that you need. So if you want to make sure that you're measuring to the correct 32nd of an inch, you're going to take that fraction and multiply it by a denominator of 32. And now we have a screaming child. Okay? All right. And let's say you want to do to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. You're going to use that decimal and multiply it by sixteen to get to the and round to the nearest sixteenth of an inch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a minute. I'm going to rewrite the board here so we actually have the chart, and uh, I'll see you in just a second. I want to make sure you understand something. These charts that I've done in your notes and everything like that. To solve these problems, they're not necessary. However, I am using them more as a tool to kind of help organize your thoughts. I could just go ahead and just show you the math this right through it, but I don't think that would be beneficial to you. However, if you're like watching these videos and like, well, this is stupid, why can't I just do That's fine. This is just a simple breakdown of things. All right, so that's what I wanted to make sure you understand. This is just one method of doing it. There's multiple ways of solving problems. This is just one way to help you. All right. Uh, first one here. Our original number is 0 0.476. Uh, we're trying to write a new fraction with a denominator of 16. So what we're going to do is my whole number in this problem happens to be zero, okay? And we need to find out what our fraction is going to be. Well, to do that, we're going to take the 0.476 and multiply it by 16. So 0.476 times 16 is going to give me 7.616. 
However, the instructions tell you to round that number to the nearest hole. When I do, I get the number 8. And that 8 is my numerator, and the 16 is my denominator. So our job simply is now to take this information. We know what our whole number is. We know what our fraction is. Is to make our final fraction. Well, in this case, it's just going to be one half because eight sixteenths is one half. And since there's no whole number, we just leave that part empty. This next one, our whole number is one. We need to find our fraction. So 0 0.695 times 16, because that's what the instructions are telling us to do, happen to be 11.12. Uh, it's going to be hard to write in left-handed. Thank you, son. Hey, not too bad. Now, however, I don't want 11.12. I want it to the nearest whole number. All right, And the nearest whole number just happens to be 11. So that 11 is my numerator. My denominator is 16. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to combine my whole number and my fraction, and I'm going to get 1 and 11 sixteenths. Same things working with 32. I want you to try this list on your own because my arm's getting tired and pause the video and then check your answers when you get back. Your final answer should have been 11 sixteenths and 4 and 15 30 second. Check your work and uh, if you did anything see where you went wrong and again like always you know how to get up with me. The last subtopic is tolerance. Tolerance is a range of numbers that we have determined to be accessible. Uh, not accessible, but acceptable. Uh, how do we determine that? Well, it can be just about anything. The example that I've given you in your notes is that you want to make a B in this class, but that's all you want. You don't want an A, you don't want a C, you don't want no D, you don't want an F. You want a B, and anything other than a B is gonna make you mad. All right, well, if that's you, you're stupid because you should want an A. But anyway, for the sake of the example, you don't want higher than a B, and you don't want lower than a B. And we can write this mathematically as 85 plus or minus 5. Okay, when I, that plus or minus means exactly that. We're either going to add 5 or subtract 5. So the lowest grade that you want to make is an 80, and the highest grade you want to make is basically a 90, and that kind of gives you an idea. Um, uh, that's not entirely accurate, but I hope you see the point. Um, so if you made a 93, is that an A? Yes, and that falls outside of your tolerance. All right, so that's kind of what you're doing now. What you want to do is you are trying to find a child who is falling out of your tolerance range. You are falling out of my tolerance range. Uh, you are trying to find a number, uh, 0 0.459, and you want to find out does it fall within this tolerance. Well, how do we do that? Well, the first thing you need to do is to find the low side of the tolerance. And to do that, you simply say 0.43 minus 0 0.5. When you do, you get 0 0.38. This is as low as you can possibly go. You can't go any lower than that. The other thing is to find the high side. How do you do that? Well, instead of subtracting like you did here, you are going to add. So 0 0.43 plus 0, 0, 0.5 is going to give you 0, 0.48. This is as high as you possibly can go. If you get any higher than that, it is far outside of your tolerance range. So now you need to look at your number, 0, 0.459. Does it fall 
between these two numbers? And the answer in this case is yes. It does. And you might be saying, but Mr. Lewis, this has more numbers. This has one, two, three, this is going four. Think this through. You have 0 0.38. What well, can really go behind the eight? Another zero. That's not a significant digit, so we dropped it. That's why we only got 0.38. What can this number really be written as? Hey, does this make sense now? Does this number fall between these two numbers? Yes, it does. So, and remember, this number and this number are the same. We just didn't have the zero one. All right, so pause the video. I'm going to hold him upside down for just a second and uh, try this on your own. You happy? Good. Alright, so we're going to try this one. When we find the low side, you should have got 0 0.448. Uh, and when you got the high side, you should have got 0 0.058. Oops, 0 0.458. Excuse me. Alright, that's what you should have got. So, does our number 0 0.459 fall between these two numbers? No, it does not. It's hi actually higher than this one, so our answer is no. So you do have some tolerance problems like that. Now, just like in the last video, would you let me finish it? I understand. I understand. <laughs> these videos are going to be wild. Sorry about this. <laughs> this is the last one, I promise. Uh, of, not, excuse me, this is the last part of this video. The word problems, as per usual, I'm leaving those to you. I want you to try those on your own. When you do, you know how to get a hold of me. If you're having problems, scan and email your work. Bring your work to me in class. I don't care. And as long as I see you working the problems out to the best of your ability, I will assist you. So, that ends this video, and I will see you in the next one.